I used to work in venture capital, and uh, unfortunately, my most well-known startup is a fake one. Um, so AI is particularly hypey, as you probably know. So during NIPS, the big AI conference, we did a we over breakfast one day, me and my team dreamt up a company called Rocket AI. The technology was called Temporarily Recurrent Optimal Learning, spelled out troll, but uh, unfortunately people missed that. Um, and we made a website and we threw a party and um, we convinced all these journalists, I won't name which publications, that this was a real company. Um, we had seven very large investment funds try and invest in us. Um, and it took a little while. It was when Business Insider kind of tried to write this, um, this hit piece on us that uh, we weren't a real company that I revealed it wasn't a company first, but it, it really was just a party theme that uh, kind of went off in one direction. But again, it's now my most uh, famous association in the AI field, and it was a drunk joke, but uh, I guess that says something about my career. <laughs> um, actually, the, the, actually, the best bit about it was not only did the police come and raid the party, which says something for an AI party, but um, we sold t-shirts afterwards that said Rocket AI with troll on the back, and I made more money off the t-shirts than we spent on the party, so yay VC. Um, but I'm not here to talk to you about fake AI companies, although there is some reference to AI hype in my presentation. Um, I, I actually hate public speaking. I think only sociopaths and academics like public speaking, and there's probably a very fine line between them anyway. So um, what I decided to do to try and get back into public speaking now that I'm a technology professional again, is that um, uh, when someone asks me to speak at an event, I'll try and give a, a title that's somewhat vague enough that I can, when I start making the slides the few days before, which is what I normally do, as I hope everyone else does, um, is that uh, I have a vague enough title that I can then think about all the things that I'm interested in and turn that into a presentation. So when Wes reached out to me, I get the title Leveraging Compute, um, which is definitely a theme of this talk, but I added last night the etc. Um, to highlight the fact that I have probably got ADHD and there is like 20 different things in this in this in this uh, presentation. So um, I'm sorry that it's not super maybe perhaps super current. Um, I joined Intel uh, eight months ago. Um, I've never worked in a team bigger than seven, and we have uh, 10,000 people in our group, 112,000 people around the world. It's big. It's intense, like a country. Um, I started in architecture, graphics, and software because my background was working in AI investment, and I moved to silicon engineering because I just found it fascinating. So uh, I'm very, very new to thinking about that. And in terms of strategy for silicon engineering, I'm not thinking about how the, the strategy in terms of what's on the silicon. I'm thinking about how we should be designing um, computers and computer chips for the for the future five to ten years out. So um, that's kind of like the theme of this talk um, across my many varied interests. So point number one. I think computing has an optimism problem. Um, and here's an example why. And, I, and I'm not just shilling for Moore's Law because Gordon Moore is the founder of Intel. I've always been interested in, in Moore's Law because Moore's Law really is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So Moore's Law, uh, Gordon Moore states in 1965 um, that the rate of transistor density will double approximately every two years. And uh, it wasn't really a prediction. I think that's the wrong way of thinking about it. It was more that he set a benchmark, and then people thought they could go out and build it. Um, so to me, this is like one of the most ex extremely uh, powerful examples of what self-fulfilling and um, optimistic prophecies can do in technology. But that doesn't mean to say that uh, people still think it's going to continue. So this is, um, I wish I had, a when will iPhones have a laser? I guess that's probably dangerous, but um, so here's some examples of kind of like tech uh, cynicism, especially around Moore's Law. I think my favorite one is in the uh, top left, everything that can be invented has been invented, 1899. Um, lots of stuff about Moore's Law dying across, across time, really, like it goes all the way back to like 2009. There is nothing new to be discovered in physics, 1900. Um, people are just really bad at, at predicting kind of like the limits of progress. Um, which is a kind of like another theme of my talk. But they've been particularly bad at doing that on transistor density and Moore's law. Um, so in terms of a say, social contract, it's probably one of our most underestimated social contracts. This is the kind of uh, multiples that we've had in uh, silicon engineering and, and, and um, computer chips in just between 1980 and 2020. So our, our group made this slide. Um, and you can see that uh, Gordon Moore was off by like a factor of a million. So um, we really tend to push past what even people predict. And I, and I think the optimistic messages about technology will be the thing that drives the future if, if we want it to be. So what has kept Moore's Law alive for 50 plus years? Well, you have more complexity because computers are getting more complicated. You have abstraction at every layer. You have innovation. 
But the thing that I actually changed from the original slides, so this was a slide that my boss, Jim Keller, who is amazing, and you should follow him, he was probably one of the best chip designers for the last 50 years. Um, he, he, had a, he had refactoring there, but I changed it to belief. Um, I think people believing that Moore's Law will continue is the thing that allowed Moore's Law to continue because they, they believed that was the next benchmark for what they should design. But Moore's Law isn't just one technology, it isn't just simple you know, exponential growth of, trans, not that that's simple, but isn't just transistor, gate, uh, transistor, transistor density. Um, Moore's Law is the uh, kind of like name for what is many, many different innovations in, um, in hardware that come together, and not just in hardware, but in physics and in math too, that compile to allow for something that is the increased numbers of, uh, of transistors. And this is kind of what I get to learn about every day. So when I moved to work in the silicon engineering group, the reason why I picked it was that I, I basically just get this amazing kind of like rapid PhD in all of these areas of physics and electrical engineering that I would never have access to. And I'm still very nascent in my understanding of some of these areas, but I wanted to highlight one. Um, and that is uh, lithography, which I'm kind of obsessed with right now. So you know, lithography is uh, how you use light to define uh, processor features. And um, by, I think you can see in this uh, image, by 2005, they kind of like hit a, a, um, a wall in, in, in progress at 193 nanometers uh, in terms of how much they could, the resolution of, of, of what they could do. And it took 15 years to get to um, the current uh, innovation that they're using in kind of like seven nanometer um, designs now which is 13.5 nanometers, and it's, it's done by a technology called extreme ultraviolet lithography. And if you ever want to be amazed by what humans can do just in one second, um, watch a video on what happens in EUV is unreal. Uh, I fell in, back in love with science when I went to go tour an EUV fab. But this is a data science slash AI event. Why should you care? Um, I think the unsung heroes of, of AI progress have been data sets and environments and access to compute. And if you look at a lot of the kind of breakthroughs in AI, it's really been these uh, two circles that uh, have allowed for those breakthroughs to be demonstrated. And um, the person who really pointed this out in, the, in recent time was Rich Sutton. He wrote a, a, did anyone read this paper? It's actually a blog post called The Bitter Lesson by Richard Sutton. Raise your hand if you read it. Okay, everyone read it, it's so good. Um, so Rich Sutton, uh, daddy of one of the daddies of reinforcement learning, um, he wrote a, a blog post in, uh, earlier this year that said, you know, if you, if you look at um, progress in AI, a lot of people spend time kind of tweaking models, trying to understand, you know, search and optimization. But if you look at how the breakthroughs come, it tends to be that something comes along and there's a new way to leverage compute. And uh, it was really powerful for me to read this because I've, I've only ever published one AI paper, but it was in reinforcement learning. And then to read Rich Sutton, who's always been a hero of mine, talk about how even in his own field, um, the, uh, the progress has really come from computation justified why I had moved into hardware. So, so Rich Sutton, reinforcement learning. Here's a brief history of RL. Um, I'm gonna use this as a case study to kind of demonstrate the, uh, how much compute um, changes what we can uh, do in AI. So, you know, it kind of like stems, this kind of reward, uh, reward feedback stems in animal psychology. And then it starts getting interesting again in, in, well, it's interesting for a bit. I mean, dynamic programming definitely played to it, but Richard Sutton and Barton wrote the book about uh, reinforcement learning. And then the thing that really cap, you know, capital, catapulted RL um, was in 2014 when, and when DeepMind uh, used it to demonstrate um, their RL agents in, uh, in the Atari games. But, Again, the unsung hero of that demonstration to me was the arcade learning environment. So we talk a lot about reinforcement learning in terms of the deep mind breakthrough, but not that many people give enough credit, I think, to 2013 when the Atari games environments were created to allow for the to agents to be demonstrated in that. So there's one which is data sets and environments. The second thing is, uh, on the other circle, is compute. So OpenAI made this great graph me because it meant that we didn't have to make it at Intel. Um, so if you, if you go back to um, AlexNet, the combinational neural network, and you go all the way up to AlphaGo Zero, you see a 300,000x um, multiple in, in demand for compute. So that really goes to show just how much more compute that we're using for different um, uh, machine learning paradigms. So here's AlphaGo, AlphaGo versus Lisa Doll. The last time I was in New York was three years ago and I was wearing a t-shirt that was in, in supporting Lisa Doll. So it goes to show that I'm on the human side. So, you know, they had, and I, and I, and I took this, I was researching for this the other day, but um, 
I think that there might have been some TPU usage when they were using this AlphaGo against Lisa Doll, but I, I wasn't quite clear. But at least compute to the same level um, of around 1,200 CPUs and 176 GPUs versus one man and one coffee. Uh, compute is, is quite cool. So I really think we need to start giving compute more recognition than, than people have been doing. And what's also interesting is the more I've kind of gone into hardware is look at how there's like this kind of symbiotic relationship between hardware and software. So I'm thinking about AI working in venture capital, starting fake AI startups, and then I go into hardware and I end up in this meeting which I just found fascinating, which was you have this problem when you're kind of doing silicon design, which is the amount of time it takes to like design and test and validate the chip is, is kind of like the lead time that you have to bring out the product against your competitors. So you're always trying to reduce that time, reduce the debugging time, reduce the validation time. And one of the ways that um, groups have been doing this, this is a group at Intel that I've been working with, is they use things like reinforcement learning to actually debug and validate. So it's, I found that interesting to think that there's like this relationship where computers are allowing for the progress in the, in the AI, but then the AI is being used to, again, reduce the time to debug back in the hardware. Okay, next tangent section of my talk. Progress is weird. Why am I saying this? Here's Bell's law. I think this is really interesting. You kind of have these uh, kind of arcs of, of compute classes that emerge approximately every 10 years. So, you know, it starts a mainframe, now it just, because of Moore's law, they keep getting smaller and, uh, and more compact. Um, and, and the reason why I bring this up is that there's this kind of been running trope for the last few years that, you know, progress, technology progress is really slowing down, um, you know, why, is, why aren't more exciting things happen? Um, and I want to make a counter example in this, in this presentation, um, I've been thinking about this for a while, that, that maybe we, we're focusing too much on the micro and not thinking enough about the macro, because when you're in uh, an arc, a technology arc, um, it kind of seems like a diminishing return because you don't know what the, the next... Um, uh, law of accelerating returns is going to come from. So whilst you're in one of these little micro um, curves, one of these micro S curves, you can't see the overall kind of exponential growth of the S curves. So when you're in Moore's law, if you're thinking about Moore's law and transistor density, you might have seen that lithography was going to reach this uh, wall in 2005, and you wouldn't know that the arc of, of EUV was coming. So um, from, from the inside, from, from the micro, it can, it can seem like it's ending, but I, I actually think that progress can be counterintuitive on the macro, and, it, and there's a reason to be optimistic. So here's some of the S curves of computing. Um, different programming languages over time, process design around chips, you know, now we have EUV uh, architectures. Each of these were curves that at one point someone thought they'd reached the end and uh, something new comes along. So uh, I don't think that uh, we should just be thinking that progress is slowing down in computing. I think we should be thinking about what the next arcs are that are going to contribute towards the macro. And here's OpenAI doing another graph for me recently that, again, saved me from doing some work. So they started plotting the usage of compute um, and uh, if, you, if you see that, that they've tracked this kind of like two year doubling that kind of follows Moore's law up to about 2013. And then it kind of goes up to a 3.4 month doubling, they say. And uh, they, they're kind of defining this in these like two areas of compute. And, uh, sorry, two areas of compute. And um, I think this is actually a really interesting slide because you think, well, what happened uh, in 2013, 2014 that allowed for this kind of, you know, uh, in increase? Um, and, I really just think it's money. And they, they, and they say this themselves in, in the paper, which is that you, know, uh, you, you start getting more money into a field, um, there's more of a drive, an economic drive to like build better hardware um, to support the new startups and, and the new companies that are being brought out. And I think that DeepMind probably played a large part in this because DeepMind got acquired by Google. It started to show people that kind of research AI groups had a, had a high value. And it meant that startup money kept going. I mean, I proved this with Rocket AI, right? We, created a fake company and, and all these venture funds started investing in us. Where the money goes, um, the, the growth goes too. So you really got to think about it from an economics standpoint. And Murray Shanahan from, uh, from England, he, he made this comment about the, the year 2014, which was that it was a year when a childhood um, passion became a global obsession. Um, and I really think that if you look back to the recent hype cycle of AI, it, it does really go back to what was happening around the, or with DeepMind's valuation. And so economics pushes growth. Uh, this is Jevon's paradox. This is actually applied to uh, uh, fuel usage, um, which is the idea that you know, as fuel becomes more e economical, then we'll just use less of it. And actually what happens is that people just end up using more. And I think it's the same for compute. Compute will just get better, it'll get cheaper, it'll get faster, but the demand for it will always um, outpace uh, the, the innovation in that sector. Next 
tangent. Does complexity kill progress? Um, I bring this up because I watched this presentation. I, I'm an advisor to a uh, distributed personal server company called Urbit. If you don't know it, you should check it out. Um, and uh, one of the engineers there sent me this talk. This is Jonathan Blow, video game designer, the guy behind Braid. Um, and it's a talk, I think it's called uh, Preventing Civilization Collapse. Has anyone seen it? It's really good. Um, so I watched it like seven times. It's, it's really, it really hit me. And I came to the office and I, I said to everyone, I've seen this talk, it's the best talk I've ever seen. And it kind of talks about how software is becoming more complex and um, uh, we depend on it. And he's trying to show you that from the inside, from the arc of the software from which he's observing uh, in the, in the S-curve, it, that it looks like that it's, uh, it's, it's on decline. And he's got a point. Uh, I have my own version of, of how I've interpreted his talk, but um, this is the lines of code in millions. Um, between different programs, so, you know, version one of Unix, not that many. Total Google web services now is at two billion, but that covers so much. Um, but there is a lot of complexity now in, in, in software. And again, for the amount of uh, executed lines of code per written code. So then the, the kind of narrative becomes, well, software is in decline and our standards for software uh, um, are getting lower. And I, and I think that's true, but I think there's another way of interpreted, to interpreting it, which is that, yeah, complex systems are complicated. Maybe we need to get over it. Two, maybe this is the wrong crowd, but... <laughs> we have too many expert Python programmers and too few generalists. But that's okay, because generality is tough. Um, I try and learn as much as I can about how computers work at every stack um, at Intel, and uh, it's just endless. Um, computers are so complicated now that to have people who actually understand full systems, I mean, people at Intel, they only know their own little one bit. I mean, some people obviously know more. You're gonna get told off for saying that. But, but the idea that people could understand the intricacies of like the entire compute stack is, is unreal now that as computers have got more complicated. So then the argument becomes, do we need a revolution in computing? And you kind of see, uh, there's, an, there's another presentation that uh, uh, Jonathan Blow referenced to in his, his YouTube talk, which is, well, in his presentation, which was, uh, the third, I think it's called the 30 uh, million line code problem, or oh, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, I'll try and link to it at some point. But uh, it kind of presents this argument. There's a lot of people saying like, okay, software's got complicated, we need to go back to first principles. And um, it makes me laugh a bit when I hear this sometimes, because it kind of reminds me of communist China. Um, and I spelt computer wrong on purpose because I do this sometimes at work, which is that there's like, should be like one computer that's gonna like run them all. And like, you know, we just have this like one better instruction set that replaced x86. And if you could all just move together on this one paradigm and go forward and all be in agreement um, and in a centralized or decentralized way, uh, I'd say that Urbit was going for that in a kind of decentralized way, then, you know, progress would happen a lot better. Um, but the counter argument to that, uh, which, which I'm gonna go into, is that it's kind of amazing how much stuff we've done with all this legacy code. Um, and it's just like unreal to me that, it, while we can be cynical about it, that like, uh, you know, it's bad and it's complicated and we don't know how computers work, it's also kind of amazing that we, we get by and, and we do it every day. Um, and it's also maybe kind of up to us. Uh, code quality is somewhat of a leadership problem. We don't want to get our hands dirty and debug across the stack. We're so used to uh, programming there being problems, um, and it's just wasting our time. And you know, maybe wasting our time is a bit of effort. It's like we're, we're used to software not working, which is one of the comments that Jonathan Blow had. Um, it's a bit like democracy. We don't just go and fix it. We just keep compiling the problems, well, compounding problems. But there are other industries and there are other complex systems that, that don't have this as an issue. For instance, aerospace. Aerospace is a very complex system. You have different vendors, different providers. You have many different uh, layers of technology and lots of legacy code. And in 2017, uh, it blew my mind that there was no fat fatalities of a, a commercial passenger jet. Um, and uh, that's despite there being more flights than, than ever before. And I think this is a good analogy sometimes for, uh, for programming and, and computer science as a whole that you know, aerospace engineers just can't let it be so shitty. Um, because otherwise, People die, and it costs billions of dollars. 
um, which is not the thing that we have to deal with every day when, when, we're, building, when we're building code. So my argument against the, uh, um, that software is, is in decline is that maybe software is in decline, but maybe the answer is, is that we've got to go in and fix it and get our hands dirty. And this was like the first meme that came up when I searched get your hands dirty that wasn't pornographic. <laughs> okay. So maybe we don't need a revolution in computers, but maybe we need a revolution in AI BS. Uh, Rocket AI was a, is a good example of how ridiculous it was. I think we were listed, I won't name the company, as one of the top 20 breakthroughs in AI in 2017 with a not real technology. Um, and people have been talking about AI BS for a long time. Here's actually my favorite AI paper. Um, it's written by Hubert Dreyfus in 1965. And he goes through and he talks about different benchmarking issues, um, the problems with uh, kind of having this kind of like narrative, uh, narrow way of doing perform performative benchmarking in, in machine learning. Um, and, you know, things haven't really changed that much since 1965. So uh, modern AI, as we have both compute, access to compute and data sets and environments allowing us to create breakthrough, demonstrate breakthroughs, we're also able to hide behind them. Um, compute and uh, data sets and environments allow us to demonstrate stuff that it should, actually isn't that general at all, but can seem general. Um, here's an example, and, 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 and I mean, I really like OpenAI, but I just wanted to give the, the Dota 5 example as one, is that, you know, Dota 5 trained on 45,000 years of gameplay, out of more than 100 characters in Dota, they only had, they only had 16. And then once, the, uh, once it was like publicly available for non-champion like non humans to play against it, very quickly humans were able to figure out how to beat it. Um, that's because brains are general and uh, these software agents aren't. Um, and the problem is tech press is, uh, is quite stupid and they write these like flashy headlines. I'm glad that, I don't know if the New York Times CTO guy is still here, New York Times is okay. Um, I wanted to give that credit, Cade Metz is actually quite cool. Um, so, but most of the tech press is just terrible. And I know that because again, I started a fake AI company and got pressed for it. Uh, here's Barney Pell, um, he is an investor and a, and, a, and a good friend. He wrote a PhD thesis in 1993, which I love, and he's talking about how games as benchmarks for machine learning um, are pretty poor because the only thing they really do is show that the, uh, that the program is able to demonstrate within a very narrow uh, framework of a game. It doesn't mean that they can generalize, but however, they'll present, people will present it as if that there's some sort of level of generality. Uh, so if you're interested in AI, has anyone read this paper? It only came out the other day. No? Oh, yes, where's Fred? Um, I read this paper actually on the, someone sent it to me, I read it on the flight here, and I always thought that, so Francois Chalet is the founder of Keras, but uh, I always found him kind of annoying on Twitter, so I never wanted to read it, um, even though it only just came out. But I, I read it, and um, it just re-sparked everything I love about um, computers and machine learning. It's such a good paper. I really hope that people will read it. Um, he just, it could be 10 papers in one paper. It's so darn brilliant. Uh, he does a kind of critique of uh, past and present AI benchmarking. So the different things that people have used, games, um, the different things that big tech companies have used to demonstrate um, their agents and their programs. But the other thing he does is he kind of goes into psychology. He, he redefines what he thinks is the, is the right explanation of what intelligence should be in terms of generality. And then for like math fans, like, like me, he then uses algorithmic inf information theory to uh, quantify how to generalize, how to generalize, uh, sorry, how to quantify the difficulty of the generalization. Like how do you, how do you test for um, kind of like the broad skill sets? Um, and, then, and then at the end, if that wasn't enough, he provides a data set, a link to a GitHub where you can kind of like test out your own agents in, in his uh, new scale for, uh, for, for, uh, for intelligence. It really is a fantastic paper. And it reminds me kind of of the old AI papers that just don't really exist anymore. So, I've jumped around like 70 different things. What are my main takeaways? Um, I think we need optimism in computing again, and not just bullshit hype. Um, I don't think Moore's law is dead. It's only dead if we want to believe it's dead, and then we won't start building the technology that we need to make there be better computers. Um, data and compute fuel AI progress, but we also hide behind them. Um, progress can look like it's slowing or declining at the micro, but from the macro it can be an exponential growth, we just can't see it. Uh, as engineers, uh, people need to get their hands dirty and fix things, and also create incentives for other people to fix those things. You should read Shelley's paper, and um, going back to his point about algorithmic information theory, is that uh, who here knows who Claude Shannon is? No, there should be so many more. 
love Claude Shannon. Um, so I don't think we have enough generalists now, but I think Claude Shannon is an example of an amazing generalist, and, and actually he's like the father of information theory. Um, but, uh, but like just like in AI, there are too few generalists, and um, here's uh, Stu uh, Hubert Dreyfus in the paper Alchemy and AI, which I, I referred to earlier, quoting something that Shannon said in 1965, and I, I love this quote so much because he said this not as a necessarily a hardware guy, as a, you know. I already think of him as a mathematician, but he says, can we design a computer whose natural operation is in terms of patterns, concepts, and vague similarities, rather than sequential operations on 10-digit numbers? Um, and that's what I like to think about every day. And um, I hope that more people who think about software and data science and, and machine learning will talk more with people who are working in hardware, because we really need better conversations between the two. Thank you. <laughs>